Hello, everyone. Response? <laughs> it's so good to be here, and thanks for inviting me and asking me to speak. Um, as has been said earlier on, my name is Ricky Nathanson. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am a transgender activist from Zimbabwe, currently residing right here in the DMV area and working for Outright Action International. So a bit about myself, um, the story that was alluded to by our host a little earlier. Um, I come from the country Zimbabwe. Has anyone, does, has anyone ever been to Zimbabwe? Have you heard about Zimbabwe? Yes? OK. Any thoughts? No? OK, great. So Zimbabwe is generally a, it's a beautiful country. Um, it's peaceful, a very peaceful nation. But however, it is a country that's steeped in transphobia, homophobia, and patriarchy. And if you couple to that, a government that doesn't observe the rule of law and does not observe uh, basic human rights and is rife with corruption, it spells disaster, especially for LGBTIQ people who face the brunt of homophobia and transphobia by a very corrupt system. Unfortunately, I too experienced what it was like to be somebody who was seen to be worse than pigs and dogs by, the, by as was once said by the President Robert Mugabe. In January of 2014, I was arrested at a hotel of my home city, Bulawayo, and guess what the crime was? For simply using a female restroom and appearing as I do here today. Albeit I'm a bit more glamorous today, but this is pretty much what I look like <laughs> back in 2014. Um, so I was arrested at gunpoint by six police officers, complete with AK-47 rifles, sun visors, treated like a complete criminal. Um, I was loaded into the back of a van, taken to the Bulawayo Central Police Station. And upon arrival, I was told to take my shoes off. Um, I had to, made, was made to sit on a cold, hard floor. And within a few minutes, I was just taken to a side room by, and made to undress, to strip completely naked in front of five male police officers. I still get very emotional when I think about it. Um, I was in, I was at the police station for three days and two nights um, under the most horrific and inhumane conditions that, that a person could imagine. I was placed in a cold, dirty, dark cell, um, given blankets that were, that, were, that were riddled in lice. It was completely pitch dark. There was not a single light in that, in, in a concrete um, cell with a steel door. <clears throat> However, I was acquitted after going to court, and being the act activist that I am, I decided that it was my right to file a civil suit against the police and the government of Zimbabwe for having violated my constitutional rights. And that is when the harassment began. <clears throat> my cell phone was bugged. Strange cars were following me around, around, um, around town. and. On two occasions, my home was broken into by security agents. The second time I was home, and I was, needless to say, I was assaulted quite terribly. But then in the December of 2018, I came to New York on business. And while I was here, I got word that they had once again broken into my home. And, and finding me not there, they went to my office uh, wanted to know where I was. And when they discovered that I was um, overseas on business, they demanded to see my itinerary. They wanted to know when I would be coming back home because they said I was needed for questioning in the president's office, meaning that it was a, I was, I was a security risk. <clears throat> that's when I decided to, decided to stay in the United States. And that's the reason you see me standing here before you today. But I'm not the only one. Trans people around the world face the brunt of stigma and discrimination, and they are the most vulnerable and marginalized members of societies. <clears throat> In 13 countries around the world, laws prohibiting cross-dressing are used to criminalize trans people. 
in 37 other countries laws around morality, vagrancy and public nuisance are also used to criminalise transgender people. In only 15 countries globally are transgender people allowed to self-identify, are allowed legal gender, legal gender recognition by self-identity, by self self-identification. So you can imagine how difficult it is for somebody not even to have a passport to be able to travel from country to country and not be harassed at airports because you don't look like what your, what your identity document says that you are. Globally, LGBTIQ rights, there is a major pushback for the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex and queer people um, at the hands of, from, of various actors, from politicians in Zimbabwe, from where I come from, to policy makers right here in the United States. And all of these policy makers stand behind some form of, they claim to be defending something, um, be it um, religion, be it family, be it societal norms, be it culture, traditional values, all at the expense and at, at the hands of the LGBTIQ people. <clears throat> These actors need to be, we need to look at how best we can, we can address these issues. And then we speak to things like hate crimes. Hate crimes are crimes that are perpetrated against individuals for their basic mere existence. And generally, because of sexual identity, sexual identity, gender identity, or sexual expression, and these crimes are grievous and heinous crimes, such as murder, assault, um, humili uh, excuse me, um, I just catch my breath. Um, <clears throat> uh, th these crimes are heinous. Speaking to, to back to trans people, um, the trans, trans people are not safe anywhere in the world. The trans murder monitoring report of last year stated that in 2020 the number of trans people that were murdered across the globe was 350 which represented six percent of the figures of 2019. In 2021 that number had increased by seven percent to 375 people so you can just see how dangerous, dangerous it is to exist as a transgender person. The most cruel and grievous and inhumane and degrading crime of hate that anybody can face is that of corrective rape. Have we heard of corrective rape? Is that term is not very common in the United States. No? So corrective rape is um, perpetrated mainly against lesbians, but also against male, ident male identifying trans, people and female identifying trans people, where rape is used as a tool against an individual to try and correct a deviant behavior, a perceived deviant behavior, be it a sexual deviance or be it a gender identity devious, deviance, and is very, very common in places like South Africa, Brazil, uh, I would say more so in Africa and Latin America. <clears throat> but those cases are totally underreported for various reasons. Um, some of the reasons that they're underreported under are fear of reprisal by the individuals, um, fear of not being taken seriously, shame, and it's often turned upon the victims when they go to the police station that they are to blame. They were the ones that were there, they, they were looking for it. So it really is really is, it's, it's, a mis, it's, it's a miscarriage of justice for those people to go and report those issues to the police and to the authorities. So what do we do? What is the, what's the answer? What is, what's the, what's the, what should we actually do to be able to overcome these, these atrocities that we face and these, these, these injustices that we see? There is nowhere that is safe. And the USA, 
the United States of America, in which I'm standing, in which I'm now living, in which we all are citizens of, is no different. Speaking again to trans rights, trans rights vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and we all know that. By the end of 2021, 130 bills had been passed in 33 states across the United States that were restricting the rights of transgender people. So what do we do? How do we overcome that? How do we make this world a better place? If we turn and look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was a pass, which is an international document that was passed by the United Nations General United Nations General Assembly, that document was promulgated to enshrine the basic rights and freedoms of every single human being that is walking this earth, regardless of sex, race, color, creed, and so forth. <clears throat> so what is the answer? What's the call to action? What do we do? My call to you and my ask to you the young upcoming leaders of tomorrow, the movers and shakers that will change the world and shape, be the theory of change to help overcome the injustices that we have faced as, as LGBTIQ people, is for you to hold states accountable, hold communities accountable, make sure that each and every single one that's a leader that is in charge of the lives of other people, observes the laws and keeps to the, human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How do you do that? Research, educate, train, and advocate. Do your homework. Find out what is happening in my university, what is happening in my city, what's happening in my country. But don't just stop there, look further afield, what's happening in the world. Because all of these synergies affect each other and it is important that we make sure that we are seen to be doing the right thing. And then stand up and speak up. But don't just pay lip service, mean what you say. Look for answers, look for solutions. Every downtrodden, marginalized individual who has been seemingly beaten by the state needs allies that not only speak to, speak with, but stand up for the rights of those individuals. And you need to speak in voices that are never loud enough. You should never be able to be shut down. And you also need to ensure that these voices are heard in, where places, in places that matter, in the corridors of power, and that's where these noises need to be made. And then we'll begin to see, and I'll close by using the words of Mahatma Gandhi, we will become the change we want to see in the world. Thank you very much.